That's Congressman Hanson from Idaho, 30 years ago served in this chamber of the House, and we're delighted to have you here today. So, so. Uh, I'm Peter Kelly, and I'm serving as the moderator of today's uh, discussion. A couple of comments at the outset. First of all, I want to say a special thank you to Norton Mazinski, who is president of the International Council for Middle East Studies. I have the privilege of being one of its vice chairs, and uh, Phil Giraldi of the Council for National Interest, who is uh, are jointly presenting this program today. Um, we were to have three presenters, but one of them unfortunately has come down with a rather serious uh, uh, tick, I think they call it Bell's palsy, and he's uh, actually in medical care now and will not be here. So we're left with these the remnants, what's left. <laughs> you know, and you'll just have to do with what you can't do with. So, anyway, my, uh, I, I have a sort of different viewpoint. This is going to be a very interesting discussion because if you look at the backgrounds of our two presenters, they're incredibly broad in terms of where they've served and what they've served. But they tend to come from the Intel sort of side of things, Department of Defense and other things. Of course, they also come from uh, service uh, uh, of a ambassadorial nature as well. But my, my viewpoint on these things is uh, from the election side. Many, many years ago, the three of us put together a thing that's called the National Endowment for Democracy and the whole stream of, of uh, foundations that have come from that. And today, I, I serve as chairman of IFAS, our president's sitting over there in the corner. And is that our senior vice president? My God, with a haircut. I didn't recognize him. So anyway, uh, here today. And so when you look at the Arab Spring from our angle, it comes down to a rather different set of issues and, and observations. And I'm going to probe these guys after they do their presentation and hope you will as well. So the first presenter is uh, Professor Paul Pillar, who uh, serves in my, uh, is now the uh, uh, director of, of Graduate Studies at Georgetown University's Security uh, Studies Program at the Georgetown Foreign Service School. Being a Hoya, I'm delighted to have him here. He has spent his life in the world of intelligence, uh, focused on uh, the Near East and South Asia, and uh, has spent a fair amount of time in the CIA Congress terror movement. It's interesting, he has, I, I don't think we're going to get to the subject today, but he has just published a book that's fascinating, uh, a book called Intelligence of uh, U.S. I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing, Foreign Policy Around 9-11 and Misguided Reform. Uh, from my vantage point, I've read a pricey the book. It's a very well-known book. I look forward to reading it. So let me present to you, uh, Professor. Come on. Yeah. I'm going to get another one. Hey, thank you very much, and, and thanks for coming out. Um, I'm going to uh, speak in kind of broad brush terms about what we call the Arab Spring, what it's all about, and how to think of it. And then I think Chaz is going to get a little bit more into the forward-looking implications for U.S. policy, although I'll touch on that just a bit. We've got this phenomenon that uh, we've, we've labeled the Arab Spring, or sometimes the Arab Awakening, singular, as if it's one thing. And, sh of course, there are some pretty obvious contagion effects, which makes it make sense to talk about it in, in, in terms of one thing. But we've got to remember we're talking about different countries, different circumstances, and I'll get to some of the differences in just a moment. What we're seeing is, is primarily, what we've been seeing over the past year, is primarily a set of revolts against what has long been the closed, calcified political and economic systems that have prevailed for quite some time in the Middle East. By that I mean economies that exhibit low growth, relatively uh, uh, rare uh, opportunities for individual advancement and entrepreneurialism, on top of political systems that insofar as they have the forms of representative democracy have mostly been a sham and so 
we have a lot of people who both have good reasons to be unhappy and a lack of political outlets for complaining about it. And related to that is, is an alienation by large proportions of the populations in the Arab countries from their politics, their societies, their economies. They don't feel part of it. They feel subject to it, but not of it. And that alienation has been accentuated through the years, especially by um, urbanization that has torn people away from the traditional roots of family and village and tribe and so on. So you have um, a set of ingredients in which a lot of people feel like they just don't have much to lose or anything to lose other than whatever is the immediate pain that can be inflicted by the regime of the moment if they start uh, causing a ruckus. The theme that we heard so much of in Tahrir Square a year ago of we're doing this ourselves, the theme of empowerment I think was very important and, and is, is the theme that I would point to more than any others that have characterized what we call the Arab Spring. It was the idea that we're doing it that is even more important than, all right, what are we going to do with that power? Which is what people are wrestling with in Egypt and elsewhere now. Of course, there were more specific substantive objectives in, in all these countries. Um, establishment of genuine, responsive political channels, what most of us would call democracy, although I would hesitate to say love of democracy <coughs> per se is what is motivating most of the people we see in, in Arab streets. There's of course also, uh, playing out in a particularly intense way in Syria right now, a uh, desire for accountability for the transgressions <coughs> of existing regimes, corruption has been a big part of that in many of these countries. And then of course, again Syria, the textbook example at the moment, the harsh and indiscriminate use of force, which then becomes a self-generating sort of thing because that is a cause for the next round of, of revolt and ruckus. Who are the rebels? Well, mixed bag, of course. Um, very broad alliance, although alliance is probably the wrong term to use. That, that suggests you know, more coordination and organization than we've seen in just about any of the countries we're talking about. Younger persons, youth, have played a disproportionate role in places like Tahrir Square. They've got the energy, they've got the time if they're unemployed, they've got even additional reasons if they're unemployed. I mean, if you're a young man in Egypt, for example, you don't have a job, you can't save, that means not only you don't have a job, it means you can't get married because you don't have the money to buy a place of your own, which is essential to get married. And perhaps some of the younger ones, by the very fact that they simply have not lived under incumbent <laughs> regimes as long, see or can conceive more of the alternative possibilities than their elders can. But I caution those comments with the further caveat that whoever is first out of the gate in the kinds of revolts we've been talking about are not necessarily the ones who are going to determine where it's all going to come out. And you look at true revolutions, great revolutions of the past in France, Russia, and so on, that's been the recurrent pattern. There are phases, and those who are first out of the gate often are not those who wind up prevailing uh, afterwards. I mentioned the differences are at least as important as the similarities, despite that single term Arab Spring. Now the Middle East has certainly had true region-wide movements. I would describe Nasserism, which is basically Arab nationalism with a tinge of socialism in those terms. Gamal Abdel Nasser certainly had you know, following and influence far, far beyond Egypt. But that's not, despite the contagion effects, really what we're talking about here, I think, with the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening. You know, there is no liberal democratic common turn that is making this stuff happen or anything close to it. The variations that we've seen, even among, say, just the, the North African countries, uh, have reflected the distribution of power and the nature of institutions that existed under the old regimes. Tunisia, for example, the, you know, the military played an important role in not following orders of the Ben Ali regime to start shooting people in the street. 
In Egypt, the military has had a somewhat different role in that they, they played, under the old regime, uh, more of an important part of politics and policy making. But like Tunisia, they were still a thing apart from the leader. So when the things really got tough a year ago for Hosni Mubarak, it was a fairly smooth thing <coughs> for the Egyptian military to say, OK, Hosni, your time is, is gone. The military had a separate identity from the regime, which was not really the case in the country between those two, Libya where given what Gaddafi had done in his four decades of rule, uh, we didn't really have uh, a security structure in a professional military that was anywhere comparable to what we had in either Tunisia or Egypt with a separate identity very much distinct from the regime. And so instead you had to rely on um, basically a rebel army that uh, uh, consisting of defectors and civilians grabbing firearms that accomplished what they managed to accomplish uh, in Libya. Sectarian uh, patterns, divides, or the lack of them, has been a major factor in the differences from one country to another. It explains, I think, why among the Persian Gulf countries, Bahrain is the one uh, area of most instability, because that's the one place you've got a Sunni ruling family uh, presiding over a majority Shia population. There's no denying that the sectarian element has been very important. And what's going on in Syria today, not to deny the other dimensions to it, but the sectarian element of Alawite and others confronting a Sunni majority is clearly a major part of it. I think another distinction is, uh, which Jack Goldstone has written about, and I, I, I'm persuaded by Jack's analysis on this, is that between the monarchies and the ostensible republics, or as Jack calls them, sultanistic dictatorships. And he makes the argument that the, the traditional monarchies, the Persian Gulf countries, Jordan, Morocco, have a built-in reserve of legitimacy that the sultanistic dictators can never hope to achieve. You know, King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia is the custodian of the two holy mosques and not just the king. Um, and also uh, that for related reasons, the monarchies have a little more latitude to play out some political rope in the sense of giving legislatures or quasi-legislatures somewhat more of a role without fear of completely undermining their own position as monarchs. We've seen some experimentation along those lines with, in the Gulf with the likes of the Kuwaitis and the Gutteries, and we've seen it more recently in a big way with Mohammed VI in, in Morocco. Um, you know, he's still a long way from being a Queen Elizabeth type you know, constitutional monarch. He's certainly got more power than that. But uh, the most recent set of uh, changes and reforms in response to the, the fear of more of an uprising in Morocco, I think was something that he as a monarch with the hereditary legitimacy was able to do better than somebody like Assad in Syria could ever do. Now the one area of uh, sort of impact and consequences I am going to get into a little bit as an old counter-terrorist hand, as you heard in the introduction, is the impact of what's been going on for extremism and terrorist manifestations of it. Basically, I see two big bits of good news in that regard from what's been happening over the past year. Um, two things that seriously undercut the extremist message of the likes of Ayman al Zawahiri. And one is we've seen significant political change, at least at the top, in the sense of Ben Ali and Mubarak being gone, that was accomplished without resort to the extremist violent methods. Uh, that is a major blow to the message of someone like Zawahiri, a you know, long-standing Egyptian terrorist who tried for years and years and years to do exactly what the crowds in Tahrir Square managed to do a year ago, which was to get rid of Hosni Mubarak. And they resort, he and his, uh, his minions resorted to an awful lot of violence back in the 1990s especially, and they failed miserably. And now someone else succeeded. The other bit of good news is, and this is still just potential good news, is that to the extent that we have something 
more like responsible democratic channels for pursuing political objectives emerge from all this, at least in some of the Arab countries, then that undercuts the extremist message as well. And the violent channels for expressing grievances and pursuing objectives become relatively less attractive by comparison. Now, offsetting or qualifying those two bits of good news, I see a couple of major reasons for concern with regard to extremism and uh, the terrorist variety of it. One is uh, the opportunity for extremists to take advantage of power vacuums and chaos. Um, I worry about that mostly right now uh, in Libya. I think Syria might be another one as well. But uh, uh, you look in, in Libya and you look at someone like uh, Mr. Belhaj, who was the, uh, basically the, the military chief in Tripoli. You know, he's, he was one of the founding members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which we still have on our list of foreign terrorist organizations. A second thing that I'm worried about even more is disappointment and disillusionment by wider populations when hopes are dashed and not met. And there, the place I'm worrying about most right now is Egypt, where the hopes have gotten sky high, as uh, polls indicate, hopes not just politically but economically. People expecting that their standard of living is going to improve significantly as a result of the political events that have taken place over the past year. Expectations that no regime is going to be able to meet. And so there is bound to be disillusionment, and my fear there is that the extremist messages re-achieve some of the credibility they may have lost. I want to say something briefly about democracy and Arab political culture. Uh, George W. Bush may well have been right when he said, uh, you know, it's just ethnocentric prejudice to say that Arabs can never enjoy democracy like the rest of us can. But I would add that, you know, it's all a matter of timing. You know, how long does it take? Uh, how long did it take us to get from Magna Carta to where we are now? Um, and we're still talking about just, you know, a little over a year of, of upheaval. <laughs> There are also vastly different views that we hear voiced already about what constitutes success as far as moves to more democratic systems in a country like Egypt are concerned. And one of the dominant patterns is that has emerged in much of the commentary is, if to put it rather simplistically, Islamists bad, secularists good. Uh, that, in my view, is a very erroneous and simplistic uh, viewpoint. I think it, uh, it uh, has tinges of Islamophobia, maybe more than just tinges, uh, and is not the constructive and appropriate way to look at and assess political outcomes in countries like Egypt or Tunisia or any of the other ones. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, uh, through all the years under the previous regimes, under Nasser and Sadat and Mubarak, was subjected to a hell of a lot of um, not very good treatment. You know, toward in latter years, they were kind of tolerated as an ostensibly illegal, but still, uh, uh, you know, a, a de facto player. And through this time, they maintained a commitment to nonviolence, as if they were preparing themselves and waiting for finally when they had a chance to do what they've done just in these most recent weeks, and that is to compete very successfully uh, as part of a peaceful electoral process. And I, for one, think it's a mistake just to say, uh-oh, Islamists are up. That's bad news for us. <clears throat> now, what about the future and all this? Well, I'm going to take a very, like a, a good former intelligence officer, a very agnostic view. Um, uh, just like the beginning of this was maybe strategically predictable, I think it was, but tactically totally unpredictable. No one could have foreseen that a fruit vendor in Tunisia would have done what he did uh, 14 months ago. In the, what ensued, uh, would have ensued from that. And I would say the same sorts of things apply to the future as well. It's safe to say there will continue to be a lot of variation from country to country and that such revolutions as we do have will go through stages. Those are pretty mild, safe generalizations to make. Much else is basically unpredictable. I think as we try to measure the impact of this phenomenon region-wide, uh, we should not just look at particular institutions that are set up or particular rulers that are toppled. 
but also popular attitudes. One thing we have seen, voiced in places like Tahrir Square, is this sense of empowerment and a, a dropping of some previous fears of oppression or harm to be inflicted by the incumbent regime. That's a significant change, but I think the jury is still out, including in Egypt as well as other countries, as to how permanent that kind of attitudinal change is going to be. Um, people have tended sometimes to compare this phenomenon in the Middle East with other waves of political change, uh, such as the one in Eastern Europe a little over two decades ago as communist rule was crumbling. I don't think that's a very good comparison. Uh, there are a couple of obvious differences that I think are very important. One was East, in Eastern Europe, it was a matter of getting out from under the yoke of a dominant power, namely the Soviet Union. That's not what we're talking about here in the Arab world. And secondly, we're talking about countries in Eastern Europe that, um, that had a previous uh, experience, more of an experience than most of the Arab countries have had, uh, with forms of uh, representative democracy and democratic procedures, and that means a lot too when you talk about political culture. There's probably no one historical analogy that fits, but I, I think uh, of a possible comparison with uh, Europe in 1848, a wave of revolutions that still appropriately occupies a prominent place in the European history books. Uh, but despite that prominent place, it, it actually didn't accomplish a whole lot. It, uh, there was a monarchy in France that was overthrown, and uh, you had some uh, serfs in the Austrian Empire who got a somewhat better deal. But other than that, not a whole lot was accomplished. Um, and moreover, that wave, even though it occurred you know, before we had Twitter and Facebook and other things that you know, accelerate the pace of events and contagion effects, had pretty much run its course in about a year. And if you superimpose that timeline on what we've been seeing in the Middle East, it does raise the possibility that this Arab Spring or Arab Awakening may have already peaked. I say may have. I'm not making a prediction. <coughs> Uh, but to the extent there are historical comparisons, that's something worth thinking about. I will end there, and um, Chaz will go into more of the uh, further implications. Let me, uh, let me introduce Chaz. He doesn't need an introduction, but I want you to think in terms of with him, wouldn't you love to have been with him? when he served as the principal translator for Richard Nixon in China back in the early 70s. Wouldn't you love to have been with him when he was ambassador to Saudi Arabia during uh, the first combat in, uh, so in, in uh, 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 Kuwait and, uh, and Iraq? Um, and a whole series of things like that. He's been a fellow at different institutions. He's been a board member with the Chinese oil. I think we need to learn more about that. Um, and he's done, he's done everything. He's done defense. Uh, he's been a, a wonderful diplomat and a great mind uh, to enlighten us. I sit on a board of the Defense Advisory Council of the CNA. And whenever he opens his mouth, I just sit back and open my mind up because I know I'm going to hear something new. Chaz. <coughs> Thank you, Peter, for that ridiculously extravagant <laughs> introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to be uh, brief. I'll therefore be very superficial, but that doesn't bother me at all. Um, years ago, uh, a wise man from the East uh, told me that uh, uh, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing superficially. And he was, of course, from the east coast of the United States. Um, uh, I don't like the term Arab Spring. Um, uh, I think that evokes some of the analogies to Eastern Europe in an earlier era that Paul correctly poo pooed. Um, so let's call this uh, series of events uh, Arab Uprisings which they disputably were. Um, I think in many respects, these uprisings, which began in uh, Tunis and Cairo and a popular revolt in a tribal and civil war 
in Libya, which has not resolved itself yet, and the disturbance of domestic tranquility by demands for reform in many other parts of the Arab world, one thinks of uh, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain in particular. Um, this really represented a um, rejection of the colonial and neo-colonial period uh, in the Middle East. This is the only region of the world in which when the colonial powers left, nevertheless continued to seek foreign protectors. protectors. Every regime pretty much in the region had somebody to whom it looked for external and often uh, internal uh, security. And after long acquiescence in European and American dominance, um, I think the Arab uh, Arabs, the Arab street, uh, tried to stand up and, um, and assert itself. And the governed in this process discovered that they could, if necessary, take back their consent to be governed and thereby compel regime change. That's a powerful lesson which I don't think is going to be erased, whatever, whatever happens. Uh, a reawakening of the Arabs by the Arabs has occurred in country after country across the wide expanse of West Asia and North Africa. Uh, the age of foreign protectorates is, I think, past, and with its demise come major uncertainties about the future. Um, the short term effect, effects of these uncertainties have already, in some, some cases, been felt more volatile oil and gas prices, for example, even before uh, the uh, war drums began beating uh, for Iran. Uh, today was a great day in that regard in which virtually every major publication had uh, some kind of article advocating an Israeli attack on Iran. You might suspect there was some coordination somewhere, <laughs> but of course that would be too cynical. Um, We've had a slower recovery from the Great Recession here, uh, and uh, the doldrums in Europe, to a lesser extent, have also been affected by the volatility in oil and gas prices. There's been an unprecedented shift, acceleration, of the shift in wealth and power to East Asia and South Asia, as well as the Middle East, coming out of this. Uh, China, of course, has been unnerved by this demonstration of power from the street um, and has taken steps that in many respects roll back some of the progress that had been made on civil society. But the shift in wealth and power is going on in Citibank, for example, um, even before we began to ratchet oil prices up by threatening Iran in the way we are, um, was projecting that by 2050, Saudi Arabia would have the sixth largest economy in the world. Um, so um, I think recent events probably make that more probable rather than, than, than less so. Um, all this aside, the long-term effects, uh, which is uh, what uh, I think I should talk about, uh, are, are, as Paul said, much harder to forecast. But I think they include some of the following. Uh, first of all, more liberalized and uh, more assertively nationalistic politics in Arab countries. And I, when I say liberalized, I don't think there's any contradiction between Islamism and democracy. The, the people who contested the elections and won were today more, mostly Islamists. And I think it is, as Paul suggested, prejudicial to posit a contradiction that they don't see. But in any event, we're going to see more nationalistic politics uh, coupled with greater self-reliance and autonomy in the management of foreign affairs. For the United States, this means that you can't get by anymore with relationships that rely on dial-up or narrow-band communication. You can't call the general, the dictator, the thug, the prince, the king who is in charge and say, fix this. Just as they can't call the White House anymore given our dysfunctional politics and get things fixed here. 
Um, so we're going to have to communicate broadband. We're probably going to have to rediscover some things we thought uh, were useless and which we euthanized, like the U.S. Information Service and other uh, other outreach activities. So, turns out Fox News is not the best advertisement for our values, <laughs> uh, and it's seen throughout the region. Um, I think along with this, uh, there is already an apparent a major reduction in the ability of outsiders, especially the United States, for obvious reasons, to shape trends in events in West Asia and North Africa. I don't think Libya was an exception in this regard, uh, mostly because I don't think we knew what we were doing. Uh, it was probably the most poorly organized military effort since the Crimean War at the outset. Um, and the political results uh, remain murky, to say the least. Um, we're clearly looking at the, fur the further isolation of Israel in the region. Not just uh, from Turkey, which has, of course, emerged as a major power, had its influence enhanced throughout the region, and it's much more important uh, than it, even than it was. Uh, but um, isolation in prospect from Egypt and even Jordan, uh, and I'll come back to that in, in, a, in, a, in a bit. Um, I think we see the potential revival of two, at least, of the three former centers of power in the Mashrek, the Arab East, Cairo and Baghdad, coming slowly. Um, Damascus, I think, in time, will be in that list, too. But uh, for now, it has other things on its mind. Um, this is not good news for Iran, um, because uh, these centers of power will now join Riyadh uh, as major influences uh, exercising their role in the, uh, uh, in the region. Uh, here I just uh, underscore something that Paul said, I think, um, in the Arab Gulf. Uh, it's not just wealth that distinguishes and the ability to buy the consent of untaxed populaces. And you have a system where the government gives you money, it doesn't take it. Uh, think of that on April 15th this year uh, in India. Um, it's not just that. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia in particular, you have a, an authentic, native-grown, homegrown political system which owes really nothing uh, to foreign models. And these revolutions weren't about bringing in foreign models and imposing them. Uh, they were about finding authentic uh, models uh, that would replace some of the foreign models that were there. Anyway, I think uh, Iran's uh, influence took a, took a knock along with that of extremists uh, throughout uh, the region. I don't notice much sympathy from Arabs uh, for Iran, even under the circumstances of misery that uh, the sanctions and other things are causing, causing there. Um, but I do know that all of this, these revolutions, as the case of Bahrain illustrates most clearly, did take place in the context of sectarian strife in the Arab world uh, that was kindled uh, by our intervention in Iraq. And this is now a dominant theme, particularly in the Gulf. Um, Turkey, I mentioned as having strengthened its role. I just want to remind everybody here of the importance of Turkey to a wide variety of interests that we and Arabs and Europeans and, and others have. You simply cannot carry out policies toward the following list of countries and, and groupings uh, without Turkish acquiescence and cooperation. Uh, Syria, as we've now learned. Uh, Iraq, as we have learned in the past. Iran, the Caucasus, Central Asia, Greece, Cyprus, the Eastern Mediterranean, Israel, the Gulf, Afghanistan, <coughs> NATO, European enlargement issues, Russia, the Islamic Conference countries. Well, there are more issues, but 
That is a longer list already than you can assign to any other country in the world. And Turks have a degree of self-confidence now that uh, is enviable um, and cannot be taken for granted on any issue. Um, a few final thoughts. Uh, I think we're seeing an acceleration in already existing trends in the region uh, to look to East and South Asia for uh, offsets to reliance on the United States and, uh, and to a lesser extent Europe. Um, it's not the case that the Chinese Navy is going to turn up in the Gulf, but it is the case that everybody in the Gulf wants it to turn up there. <laughs> uh, so there is a demand pull now for India and China to get involved that we need to contemplate having taken it for granted that this was our domain. Um, and I think, as Paul said, a very important development from our point of view is the displacement of the jihadi threat uh, to Arab societies as milder forms of Islamism assume a, a larger role in governance. Uh, and um, here I want to just make a, a last comment on Islamism and then I'm going to stop because I'm really much more interested in what you have to say and, and, and what your interests are. And that is that uh, we forget, um, Paul mentioned the Magna Carta and the difficulties it took the West <coughs> to develop democracy. We forget it, that in the 19th century it was an article of faith with most intellectuals in Northern Europe at any rate and here that there could be no such thing as Christian democracy. The Catholic Church is a hierarchical institution. It is authoritarian in the extreme. And it was said with great uh, conviction that uh, Christian democracy, Christian democratic parties were a contradiction in, in terms. Uh, the same sorts of ridiculous assertions are now made about Islamic Democratic Party, despite the existence of the AKP in Turkey, despite the existence of Hamas, which has other characteristics as well, but is a democratically based uh, movement and therefore seen as a threat by authoritarians. My point is that if new consultative forms of governance arise in the Arab world as a result of the ferment that's going on, um, we should not be surprised. And we should also be aware that the Arab world is 20% of a larger Islamic world, which is looking for models as well. And the influence of what happens in this part of the Islamic world uh, could be very, very large. i close with a couple of thoughts on Egypt and, and, uh, and Bahrain. Um, in 1922, the British uh, nominally gave Egypt its independence. Actually, they put it in the hands of the Egyptian military who have managed in one way or another uh, to retain control uh, ever since. Uh, that's 90 years. So we shouldn't be surprised that notwithstanding Tahrir Square and the events there, uh, the Egyptian military uh, is reluctant to abandon the perquisites it has acquired over these uh, nine decades, uh, or that it insists on calling the shots. Um, and I think this underscores a point that Paul made, and that is that revolutions uh, often come <coughs> in various explosive phases. And I don't think we've seen the final form of the Egyptian revolution. And like Paul, I am concerned that the combination of rising expectations and diminishing returns for the populace uh, is the sort of condition that gives rise to the sort of thing that happened in Germany in the 1930s. Um, and finally, with regard to Bahrain, uh, this is in a sense um, a perfect storm because it unites uh, a radicalized a Shiite group within the Shia majority who have embraced the life of Faqih, the Iranian notion of rule by jurists or clerics, 
and who are negotiating with the Bahraini monarchy had referendum to a council of clerics, very much in the Khomeini style. Um, and the problem with negotiating with people who have a direct line to God is that uh, it's rather hard to persuade them uh, that God is wrong and you're right. Uh, so this is not as simple by any means as many people imagine, uh, and one has to have a bit of sympathy uh, for the government of Bahrain and the difficulties it faces, uh, regardless of what you think about how it handled the initial uh, mob in the streets. We, of course, managed to come out of all this, we Americans, with diminished credibility among rulers, uh, and continued skepticism and suspicion among their opponents. I don't think we could have saved Hosni Mubarak, but others who had counted on our protection were dismayed when we didn't make much of an effort. Um, those who saw us run around to the front of the democratic parade and pretend to lead it uh, were not particularly persuaded by that. And so, quite aside from everything else that's going on in the region. The, this is the region where mirages were first viewed and identified. There are mirages. People see a peace process where there hasn't been one for 12 years. Uh, people uh, see nuclear weapons where there aren't any, and they don't see them where they are. And um, I could go on. But um, it is a, um, it is a, a, a region in which our credibility at the moment uh, is uh, greatly lacking and requires restoration, which will not happen in an election year. Thank you. <laughs> you guys wouldn't mind that microphone is not for the audience, but for the tape machine. All right, just speak so up. If you would use it as you answer questions. Uh, do we have any questions? No, no, sir. Oh, yeah. I've, I've got several, but I don't know how long I was interested in either last. I, I, I want to ask the question. The, the, uh, thank the prospects for the, the peace between Palestine and Israel. We have heard many times that the window of opportunity for a peaceful settlement is closing. I believe it closed some time ago and that the next developments are going to be violent. Well, this is a whole new subject. The, the, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. It's a related subject. It, it's a, re let me, it, a, a quick comment on, um, on that larger topic that we're not going to take time to, to go into. I am not quite as pessimistic as to whether the two-state solution has had the last nail driven in its coffin yet. Uh, so I'm perhaps a, have a bit more hope than you do. Let, let me try to relate this to the, our overall topic um, and supplement what, what uh, Chaz said on this in terms of uh, Israel standing in the region. Um, as, as some Israelis, not those in the current government, fully realize, a, a more democratic Middle East amid or coupled with a resolution of the festering Palestinian issue would be a far more favorable and comfortable environment for Israel to live in for years and years to come. Unfortunately, that does not seem to be the perspective of the current Israeli government. And uh, we hear specific concerns about what's going on in the Arab countries that are very specific about, well, will Egypt abide by the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty? Well, you, know, you look at what the parties in Egypt are saying, and uh, I'm not too worried about that. And as all of the Egyptian parties fully realize, if we had a new Egyptian-Israeli war, the Egyptians would get absolutely trounced militarily. Um, I think what, what doesn't get voiced as openly is are more general reasons that the current Israeli government, uh, in the absence of a settlement of the Palestinian issue, uh, does not especially like this Arab democratization business. Um, 
one reason is that because uh, anger over Israeli policies on the Palestinian issue is widely and broadly shared by populations, it is not just a creation of regimes, then to the extent that we have Arab governments in which, going back to uh, Chaz's opening point, we have a much more open um, uh, expression uh, and, and uh, outspoken expression of views, then we're, we're going to be hearing from Arab countries a lot more open criticism and harsh criticism of Israeli policies. They won't have a pal like Hosni Mubarak to, to kind of keep it under wraps. A second reason is that to the extent that uh, issues of popular sovereignty are getting more attention in Arab countries, that highlights all the more the absence of popular sovereignty for, for Palestinian Arabs. And I would add a third reason, which you certainly don't hear voiced uh, by the Israelis, uh, which is that for years and years now, one of the main claims for uh, Israel to enjoy the extraordinary special relationship it does with the United States is that it's the only democracy in the Middle East. To the extent that it no longer is the only democracy in the Middle East, that rationale obviously gets greatly weakened. But, just. I'd, I'd uh, add only a few points to that. Uh, I think um, we're in a new era as far as uh, the issue of peace is concerned. I'm more pessimistic, I think than Paul, uh, because I don't see where the land for a second state could come from at this point. Uh, so I think we're headed for a one-state solution, which means a sort of struggle against apartheid, meaning a three-tier arrangement in the area that Israel rules, in which Israeli Jews enjoy full citizenship, although those rights are being curtailed. Uh, Israeli democracy is shriveling in some ways. Um, which is another problem to the extent Israel ceases to be obviously in line with our values that that erodes our relationship as well. Uh, but uh, you can't have uh, first class citizens, second class Arab citizens of Israel and a third class of people who are helots who have absolutely no rights whatsoever, namely the Palestinians in Gaza and in the occupied territories. This is not sustainable. So. Uh, what, what has happened uh, is um, uh, that the Palestinians have uh, given up on the U.S. as a uh, mediator for peace uh, and decided to take their case to the conscience of mankind, strangely resort to the premier multilateral institution in the world is described as a unilateral move, uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, at this point uh, with the exception of the United States and uh, the Marshall Islands and Palau um, uh, and sometimes Australia and once in a while Canada, uh, Israel is very lacking in international sympathy and support. Uh, so I think this business of going to the UN, establishing credentials as a state at the UN and then resorting to institutions like the International Court of Justice to put pressure on Israel is a serious strategy that Palestinians who are now trying to acquire unity will follow. And I don't think uh, we have much credibility with them to call it off. A second point, and this is, um, it goes to the military balance issue. Um, since Camp David, 78, 79, which is to say, uh, what is that, 33 years, I guess, um, the, um, maybe 34. Um, Israel's gotten used to having no serious military threat of any kind on its border. Um, Israel cannot be menaced by Egypt, as Paul said, without Syria also in that fight. Uh, and Syria is defenseless without Egypt. And actually the Israelis have shown on numerous occasions they can beat them both. But the fact is that Israel hasn't faced a, a conventional military threat of any kind. It has focused on Iran and, to a lesser extent, Iraq, which are remote from its borders. And uh, that could easily change. Um, there's the Camp David Accords are very unpopular in Egypt, in part because if you read them, you'll discover the first part of them has a lot of Israeli obligations, none of which have been discharged. 
um, having to do with self-determination for the Palestinians and withdrawal from the occupied territories. Um, this, and uh, uh, the, uh, the prospect of a political system in Egypt that is dominated by Islamists who are not afraid to voice their criticism of Israel does raise the possibility of that framework eroding. Um, at the same time, uh, you have the possibility, I think the very real possibility, that the Assad regime will collapse at some point and be replaced by a far more extremist version of Sunni Islamism um, in a context in which there's no peace with Israel at all. Um, this could bring back an Egyptian-Syrian alignment against Israel in which Turkey and Saudi Arabia might well play. Saudi Arabia's concern is to get the Iranians out of Syria. And once that's over, uh, then the Palestine issue might loom large. So I think you, one reason you don't hear much about Syria from thoughtful Israelis who normally have very interesting things to say is some concern about this kind of prospect. Um, so um, you could, in fact, end up with a rather wide coalition in the region uh, spearheading an international support effort for the Palestinians against Israel in the one-state solution context, uh, which ought to be a nightmare for the Israeli right wing, and I suspect it is. Uh, hello, here. It's, it's not live for us, it's just for the tape. Okay. Uh, Steve Winters, local researcher. I just wanted to focus on one point that both speakers touched on, which was uh, what they considered to be uh, uh, an, uh, an, 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 an incorrect analogy to the uh, East European uh, democracy movements in the early 90s. Uh, Ahmed Mayer, the, probably the most widely recognized organizer of the April 6th movement in Egypt, spoke here in DC you know, a couple of months ago. And uh, it was very clear that uh, his movement and himself personally has, extens has conducted extensive networking with people in Poland, for example, to be specific, on to try and learn from them, their, their, from their experiences 20 or so years ago, uh, of a mass democratic movement that overthrew them. So I, rather than speaking in analogies are true or not, I would rather look in terms of influences. So I think I would suggest strongly, I realize, try to make this no question I can do, that people look into that and see exactly what the carryover is from the East European things in the actual movements going on in Egypt. And also, I don't think it's as disorganized as was suggested by the first speaker. Good comment. Sir? Uh, <clears throat> my question is in two parts. Uh, the first part for Mr. Pilar would be, you mentioned that there was no, uh, as I recall, no liberal um, common term that could be detected behind the, the spring movement throughout the region. I'm wondering to what degree you think, uh, at least in Egypt, they think that American NGOs are part of the liberal common term that has uh, underlined regimes, particularly with respect to the, the um, Americans that are now apparently being indicted uh, by the courts there. What, what uh, extent do you think that reverberates say, through the region? And then for Mr. Freeman, uh, to what degree do you see this um, as part of the antagonism that's arising in China and Russia vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.? Do you think tensions there are arising because of the perceptions that the United States is involved in facilitating regime change? Do you understand? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't think we're talking about a, an international common turn like phenomenon, but you're absolutely correct to, to bring out the uh, suspicion um, which underlies this uh, uh, unfortunate situation we have with the uh, NDI and IRI and Freedom House uh, uh, people in Egypt today. There, there were excellent articles in both the New York Times and Washington Post today on this very subject. Um, which amplifies uh, your point that there has long been distrust uh, of uh, what such organizations are really doing and are they more uh, a matter of Western subversion as, a, as opposed to what, what I think they really are and what they are trying to do, which is to impart you know, political skills to people who, uh, who can use them. Uh, I think this is a, an illustration of um, uh, Chaz's uh, general point about 
people in the region are not uh, trying to import foreign models. They're looking for indigenous models. And I'm afraid part of this uh, suspicion is, uh, is wrapped up with this negative view toward foreign models, but it's also even more of a conspiracy theory kind of thing than that, 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 that these are outright subversive organizations uh, that are doing the bidding secretly of the U.S. government or something like that. Uh, it's going to take a long time to dispel that, and I don't know if we can ever dispel it, but that is a, unfortunately a major factor uh, in the current impasse with Egypt. Well, I'm going to make a comment on that. Uh, IFAS, International Foundation for Election Systems, Electoral Systems, has been in Egypt seven years. Um, we are actually one of two organizations that are actually registered to do business in Egypt. The other one is the city program of the American Bar Association. Um, we are working directly with the various constituencies that make up this electoral process. Uh, clearly what we do is dealing with, there's no politics in what we do in that we're talking about the mechanics of election, the, the, the every single step that has to be taken, but there are all kinds of subtle things that take up, that come on. And uh, other than impatience and pride, those are two words that uh, should make the word Egyptian, um, are very much at play and uh, pre prevent anybody with difficulty. What's happened with the other institutions, uh, I don't understand, but I know that we've not experienced it. John? I'd, I'd like to um, connect uh, talk briefly about the first part of your question directed to Paul and connect it with the previous comment uh, because uh, I think people in the region uh, in fact are in interested in eclectic borrowing selectively from foreign models which accounts for the interest in constitution building <coughs> uh, models from Eastern Europe but there is a and, they, and a sense of course that those were transitions which were difficult to manage, from which you might learn something. Um, and all of that is true, and it's encouraging in a sense. What is discouraging is that the success of the transitions in Eastern Europe depended on huge transfusions of cash and know-how from Germany and others in Western Europe, and to a lesser extent from the United States. There is no such support going to uh, the transitions uh, in, in places like Tunisia and, uh, and, and Egypt, uh, nor will there be such support in Syria if that uh, country undergoes, which is a very complicated situation and, uh, and not probably in danger of sorting itself out imminently. Uh, but if, when it does change, I don't think we will see the investments either. And this is really sad because we now have a track record in terms of building respect for human rights and the rule of law, beginning with Taiwan and Korea and extending to Eastern Europe. And in every case, success has come after a major effort directed at assisting the judiciary, the legal profession, um, the uh, security authorities uh, to learn how to take evidence with fingerprints, not fingernails. Um, and we're not making that effort, so that does not bode well. Uh, on the question of Chinese and Russian antagonism uh, toward the United States, there are many reasons for this, not least uh, their dislike of our unilateralist um, uh, tendencies and our assumption that we can impose our will on countries through the international organization structure, UN Security Council and so forth. A great deal of it has to do with their um, uh, view of Libya as a grotesque case of the stretching of a mandate well beyond its breaking point. Uh, open intervention to overthrow the government when the international mandate called for the protection of the civilian population. Um, and if you cheat, as we did, um, then you should not be surprised if the next time you offer a deal, uh, people uh, have their suspicions and, and refuse it. Uh, there is also a background of color revolutions, so-called, which is of concern to both the Russians and the Chinese. And uh, finally, I suppose, since both of them have Leninist heritages, uh, they know how to do subversion and they suspect we do too. 
Um, uh, I think they're wrong about that. Uh, we're not very good at it. Uh, but I can understand why they would engage in mirror imaging uh, as they look at NDI and Republican Institute, IRI. Chaz, let me, uh, let me ask you a question to China. You indicated that there's a, obviously an internal Chinese response to this. Could you, uh, that's, that's huge, of course. Can you detail a little bit of what you meant by that? Um, China had begun to develop a uh, steadily liberalizing uh, civil society that was aided and abetted by uh, the internet uh, and, and social media uh, that were internet based. This does not include Facebook, which is bad, but it does include Chinese versions of, of, that, of that phenomenon and Twitter and the like. And, uh, there are now, I think, the last figure is 520 million people online in China. Um, and uh, uh, Chinese are very well informed about the world. But uh, the government is so concerned about this that the Politburo Standing Committee, I am told, twice a day gets a report on what's being said in, uh, in chat rooms uh, on the internet. And this is having some of the same dampening effect on Chinese decision making that uh, uh, promiscuous polls, uh, polling of the political attitudes here do, uh, do on politicians. Uh, it may account for widespread complaints in China that their government is less and less decisive in resolving internal uh, squabbles and, uh, and contradictions. Um, I think the Chinese uh, have a problem. Um, I saw a, sim a similar problem in Taiwan uh, 40 years ago. Um, in which, uh, you know, uh, people would say to me, um, I, I speak Taiwanese, or I did, uh, they would say to me, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the Guangdong, the Nationalist Party, is no good because they have no vision, uh, they lost the Civil War, uh, they, uh, they're corrupt, uh, you know, they're feathering their own nest, um, and they make us study this ridiculous socialist ideology called the Three Principles of the People, which they don't pay any attention to in, in, in daily life. Um, so, you know, I said, when I heard this from everybody, I said, you know, I'm the dumb foreigner. Uh, if this is the case, why don't you get rid of them? And um, the answer, and people look at me as though I was not, which I clearly wasn't, um, and said, uh, they gave me an answer, and the answer was, uh, you know, somebody's got to be in charge, and there's no alternative. Uh, and if we tried to create an alternative, they'd probably kill us. And third, this is a really stupid question, because life is getting better, and so why bother? And now you hear exactly the same thing on the mainland about the Chinese Communist Party. The what happened in Taiwan was the son of Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Jingguo, came along and changed the core membership of the Kuomintang and opened up the political process in ways that allowed a gradual evolution away from Leninism and toward politics based on the old who gets what, when, and how constituency services formula. Um, People in the mainland would like that to happen, but they're not confident it can. And the party is very aware of the fact that if it stops delivering jobs and economic growth, it doesn't have much legitimacy left. Uh, so this is why Chinese behave as they do in response to trade complaints and, and so forth. Uh, this is a system which depends on constant creation of new employment and progress in the economy. As long as that goes on, everything's fine. The minute it falters, uh, then uh, things like what happened in the Arab Street become uh, very frightening to the leaders. Thank you. Am I right over? Yes. Um, both of our distinguished speakers uh, were either uh, either were senior intelligence officials or should have been. Um, and so I would like to take the former. We're not appointed. Um, 
So I'd like to take advantage of that fact to ask if you would both uh, simulate for a moment uh, being a senior intelligence analyst in a government with an interest in the situation in Syria and relative neutrality or objectivity uh, and, and give us quite briefly, of course, your, your best estimate as to what are the intentions and capabilities of the United States for intervention in the situation in Syria. Not, not military intervention necessarily, but intervention in any, in any meaningful sense. And particularly, of course, covert, uh, covert operations in Syria. <laughs> no, this is a rush to answer. <laughs> Uh, Gareth, that wasn't my part of the business. <laughs> um, I think, it, it, well, the, the short answer is they're pretty meager, uh, in my view. Uh, that is to say, ones that um, would have a chance of um, increasing the odds of, of favorable results. Um, I don't. I don't have. I, I'll just. I won't try to put on an intel hat. I'll just just a policy hat. I don't pretend to have some uh, good solution or recommendation in Syria. I, I. I think it's going to get a lot worse than it, before it gets better. Um, I. I share Chaz's vision of uh, the end game being or the end result being. Um, a regime that uh, is going to seem certainly far more threatening to the Israelis and that lots of people here will um, dislike even more than what we've seen, at least on the you know devil we don't know being worse than the devil we know kind of basis. But if you're talking about things that the U.S. and West can do, there's been a lot of talk in terms of short of direct military intervention of supply uh, arrangements with the Free Syrian Army, that sort of thing. Um, that would stoke a civil war. It wouldn't settle it. Uh, it would, um, at least in the near to midterm, uh, increase the amount of bloodshed in both directions uh, with the force on the other side being a regime that consists of and is being supported by elements that believe they're fighting for their lives and not just for power. And I'm not talking just about the Assad family, I'm talking about mostly the whole Alawite community, as well as you know, parts of the, the Sunni uh, power structure that have been, uh, been co-opted. And the Christians, and the Druze, and, and the secular Muslims. Who, who, share, who share fear of, uh, of an Islamist state that they would not like. How you intervene in that in a way that um, helps either from a humanitarian point of view in reducing bloodshed or increasing the odds that the regime that, that emerges from this is going to be more to our liking, I frankly don't see. But maybe Chess has a better idea. No, I think we have the United States, um, as is all too often the case, has spent decades in ensuring that we have no influence and no insights in Syria. Uh, this is what happens when you try to ostracize and disengage. There's a basic maxim of military science, which is you never lose contact with the enemy. Uh, and we ought to practice in diplomacy the same notion uh, that you remain engaged, even if you don't agree with someone, especially if you don't agree with someone. You should be trying to understand uh, what drives them. Um, I think Paul referred to the complexities inside Syria. We don't know what's happening inside Syria. We have a flow of disinformation from the regime and from various opposition groups um, filtered through Beirut and other places um, and um, uh, as close as anybody can tell roughly half, maybe slightly less of the population, is still uh, committed to the regime, if only out of fear of the alternative. Remember, Syria is next to Iraq, and it has a lot of Iraqis who are still in asylum there. 
and no Arab can look at Iraq, notwithstanding the neoconservative promise that it would be a model, and <laughs> consider it a model of anything except something to be avoided. So the Syrian populace looks at this. <clears throat> now, uh, since we have no influence and no insights, uh, we have successfully limited our options uh, rather radically. Uh, I, I would say, you know, in normal times one should follow Turkey on this, uh, but our relationship with Turkey is not particularly good. Um, we do seem behind the scenes, I hear, to be trying to produce some sort of coalition of Saudis, other Gulf Arabs, and Turks directed at undermining the regime. Um, if anybody in this room imagines that there is no large covert action program uh, already going on inside Syria, not from us, uh, but from the Gulf. Think again. If you read the Arab League report on the failure of their observer mission in Syria, um, first of all, it doesn't say at all what our press says about what's going on. It paints a very different view. It's not tendentious, but it does it does indicate pretty clearly that they ran into a very large covert action program. It doesn't say who was behind it, but you might get a guess by realizing that Qatar and Saudi Arabia were the ones who took the Arab League to the UN on the issue. Um, so I think um, this is an enormously complex situation in which we have really no clear cards to play and um, we the one thing we shouldn't do is imagine that it's all about uh, installing a secular democracy in Syria that's not what it's about um, and I think the Israelis are right to be cautious about it I'm trying to find a volunteer to do that but nobody volunteering <laughs> Thanks. There, there's been just peripheral mention of uh, what I think is sort of the 900-pound gorilla on the dining room table, which is the prospect of a either Israeli or U.S. or some coalition attack against Iran sometime in the immediate months ahead. Um, I guess my question, since we're talking about the Arab Spring, uh, twofold. Number one, um, the initial events in Tunisia, Egypt and other places were clearly internally generated. Uh, there's a real question about whether the same is true after a certain point for the events in Libya and certainly now the events in Syria. And um, so the outside factors that have come into play in the region, including the involvement, it seems, of the US and Europe on one side and now Russia and China on the other, adds a much greater dimension to the situation. And, uh, I'd like to get your sense of what the consequences would be if uh, there were to be military action sometime this year against Iran, both in terms of uh, how that impacts the Arab Spring and the larger global situation. Well, I'm sorry that Pat Lang uh, couldn't make it because this is um, exactly up his, uh, his alley. Um, I, I'll just give you my own um, moderate, modestly informed view. Um, I don't think there's any coalition that's going to attack Iran. Um, I think if Iran is attacked, well, first of all, Iran is under attack. Uh, let us be clear. Uh, there are people being murdered. There are bombs going off. There is a campaign which, if it were <laughs> perpetrated anywhere else, would clearly be recognized as state terrorism going on inside Iraq. So uh, the fact that the Iranians, for their own reasons, have chosen to respond uh, very cautiously and primarily rhetorically is, I think, a good thing, but you can't count on it forever. The second element is that we have put in place what we describe as crippling sanctions. We began with sanctions which the proponents described as directed, targeted at the Republican Guard and the Al-Quds Force and so forth and so on. 
we are now openly trying to bring the entire society to its knees. And we, we, we talk publicly about how we're going to turn the screws and we're going to overthrow the regime and we're going to, you know, and we don't care how much suffering the Iranian people go through as, during this process. Uh, there are several problems with that. Um, first, the last time we really did this kind of bring them to their knees sanctions was 1941 against Japan. And we did succeed in getting their attention. Um, and they did something which, under normal circumstances, they would not have felt was a wise or appropriate thing. Um, I don't think Iran is inspired by Bushido or that um, it has a fleet in being to attack uh, an American base uh, and on any scale, uh, and I don't think it's that crazy. But the fact is, if you put people in desperate conditions, they sometimes do desperate things. Uh, it is sometimes said that the threat to close the Straits of Hormuz, which are 21 miles wide at their narrowest point, with two two-mile-wide ship lanes running through them, is um, infeasible. Uh, Iran can't do that. Uh, that might be true over a sustained period uh, for warships, U.S. naval vessels. It is not true for tankers. Uh, tankers can are very vulnerable to mines, of which Iran has more than 2,000. Uh, torpedoes, which Iran's small patrol craft are well equipped with, cruise missiles, artillery, ballistic missiles, all of which Iran has and which it can fire from the shore or at sea in sufficient quantity to ensure that Lloyds of London will not insure a ship. And believe me, ship owners don't go where there's no insurance. So I think we're talking about a very a game with really high stakes with some models showing oil at $250 a barrel, um, and at a time when the global economy cannot sustain a major shock. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we're playing with, uh, with, with a very dangerous thing. Quite aside from what I believe the game is, uh, which is, first of all, to provoke Iran into doing something retaliatory that would justify attacking it, which is why it has responded cautiously uh, to the murders and bombings and the constant threats of attack. Um, or, failing that, uh, for Israel to launch an attack uh, which results in retaliation and leaves the United States with no political choice, given the complexion of our politics, but to come in on the side of Israel. <coughs> Israel's capabilities are considerable but limited at that range. This is on the outer periphery of their reach. Uh, and um, while they have both um, ballistic missiles, submarine launch missiles, uh, as well as bombers, and they have very good special forces, um, the chances that they could do anything but uh, set the program back for a short period, relatively short period, are not great. Uh, so, um, uh, we have an administration which is apparently very reluctant to get into uh, this kind of conflict um, in which the military and intelligence establishment, as is the case in Israel, advise against it. Uh, but we have, as I mentioned today, at least seven articles. Bloomberg, New York Times, Washington Post, two articles of Washington Post. Um, and, uh, well, the whole blogosphere. Um, um, alight with the case for attacking Iran. Uh, so, somebody wants war with Iran, uh, not me. If I can just add, add briefly, I, I certainly share Chaz's concerns about where this current uh, ever tightening sanctions business is leading given that uh, if the uh, most recent uh, uh, turns of the uh, screw work as they supposedly uh, are intended to work as of the middle of this year, that is the functional equivalent of a military blockade of Iranian ports and oil exports. and. Um, 
yes, uh, we, we shouldn't be surprised if they try to strike back. I think, you know, as far as the motivations are concerned, uh, there, there are some elements here, as well as in Israel, that want to do, as Chaz described, that this, this would uh, provoke the Iranians into, you know, firing the first shot. Uh, I think to a large extent uh, here, and I, I think in Western Europe, there are many others who aren't trying to play that game, but are just blindly forging ahead uh, uh, with pressure and more pressure, sanctions and more sanctions, because they've become almost an end in themselves. And in the political milieu here in the United States, it is, you know, de rigueur to be uh, as hardline as possible in your rhetoric and your actions uh, against Iran. As far as the larger consequences, whether it is provoking Iran to fire the first shot or Israel fires the first shot, that's of course a far bigger topic. It goes into such things as the asymmetric Iranian response that can affect us here in the homeland and everything else. But just to tie it back to our current topic, some of the things we've talked about in terms of uh, the, the Arab uprisings, I would say a couple of things. Uh, one, it would uh, accentuate um, that isolation of Israel that uh, uh, regionally that um, uh, Chaz referred to, it would reduce further, further U.S. influence uh, in the Arab world. Uh, it would reduce or, or tend to undo some of the bad news for Iran that Chaz described earlier. Uh, the whole idea, you know, that was perpetrated, uh, I'm sorry, that, that was promoted uh, by, uh, you know, particularly during the previous administration here, about a so-called moderate alliance uh, against Iran, in which we'd include us and Israel and Arabs we like, um, simply does not accord with the way Middle Easterners view the political map of their own region. And if you had this event that you're talking about on top of this, uh, the lines would be drawn more harshly, certainly not the way that we were talking about them the way we'd like them to be drawn a few years ago, and they would come out very much to our disadvantage, as well as the long-term disadvantage of the Israelis, I might add. I want to, uh, just on sanctions, I, I want to add a couple of, uh, of uh, points. Um, I don't know of any instance, including South Africa, as the former administrator of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, I do not know have any case in which um, sanctions that challenge a nationalist agenda have succeeded in overcoming um, resistance. Uh, they tend to um, force people to become more recalcitrant rather than, than less, and so far Iran is no exception. Um, we should ask, before we get into these kinds of things, where sanctions are seen as an end in themselves, the question is, are the sanctions hurting Iran? Nobody asks the next question. Uh, and is Iran changing its policy or thinking about it? Uh, which is supposedly the purpose. Um, the hurt, the pain becomes an end in itself. Before we get into this, we should ask, always ask the question, how does this end? And then what? Um, we are, we have already had a declaration from Tehran, not, not surprisingly, that they are going to oppose Israel in every forum, in every way that they can, everywhere, in an active way. I believe they're already, they have readjusted their approach to Afghanistan uh, to in damage us. Um, if there were a war in the Gulf, um, the operations that we conduct in Afghanistan, which depend on tankage and direction from the UAE and Oman and, and the base that Qatar has left with us at the date. These, um, uh, these uh, things are very vulnerable to uh, Iranian uh, countermeasures, uh, unconventional in nature. Um, you could end up with the, our forces in Afghanistan really completely isolated. Um, we also have something we call an embassy, which probably should be called a crusader castle in Baghdad. <laughs> Um, 16,000 Americans, more Americans than there were British to administer India under the Raj. Um, <laughs> what they're doing uh, with each other and to the Iraqis, I do not know. I'm not sure I want to know, but in any event, there they are, sitting in the midst of a population with multiple grievances, uh, much of which is pro-Iran. Um, uh, and finally, uh, to just buttress Paul's point, um, 
Iran, of course, depends on oil exports uh, for the bulk of its revenue. Uh, if it can't export oil, uh, I suspect it's not going to want to let anybody else do it. Um, and if that's where we're headed, we're really in trouble. So I think this is a scenario that calls out for some rethinking. Um, and the, that brings me back to the point on sanctions. The only time sanctions are ever useful is if they are tied to a negotiating strategy and to some yesable proposition that the other side can agree to with sufficient dignity to make that agreement effective and which will end the, 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 the pressure. Uh, the way the Congress has set up these sanctions, the President does not have the authority, either politically or legally, to call it off. So there is no negotiation at present, and there is no prospect of a negotiation. This is not a happy situation. Earlier you spoke of how the, the freedom enjoyed by the Egyptian military largely allowed it to retain the majority of its power when the regime was dismissed. Um, what role, if any, do you think it's going to have in shaping the development of the current Egyptian regime? The Egyptian military is uh, trying to figure out, has been trying to figure out itself over the last year what it wants, uh, let alone how it hopes to accomplish that. Um, I suspect, I'm, I'm just, just guessing here, I'm not a fly on the wall of the SCAF meeting room, but uh, Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, uh, that there are a range of views between those who see themselves as, uh, as military professionals first and foremost and would, <coughs> would like to you know, back, back out of politics and, and uh, get back to the barracks. The, the big complication is the Egyptian military has had this extraordinary economic position and privileges um, that it might be difficult to separate from, from the political side of things. Um, if, if they no longer have the political power, you have a truly representative civilian government, the kinds of economic privileges that the military officers have uh, could not just stay stay unmentioned forever. I mean, maybe some arrangements would be worked out, but that in effect is saying that the uh, the Egyptian military would still have a political role. They're, they're feeling their way, they're stumbling their way. Uh, this whole um, uh, last several weeks of uh, Egyptian political history has reflected the SCAF not having a hard time figuring out what they want. I'm referring to the backs and forth with regard to the electoral calendar and when are we going to have the presidential election and how does that jibe with the writing of the new constitution? The most recent thing was just in the last day or so, apparently the orders went out from the SCAF to, to move presidential election preparations up even, even farther, which suggests that uh, even the June date that was uh, mentioned before may be seen as, as on the late side. So they're trying to figure out themselves what they want to do, but the, the biggest problem I see is this economic political nexus and how it would be so difficult to disentangle the two. Just to add that uh, the economic privileges enjoyed by the Egyptian military include the ownership of a fair senior, chunk. Senior. Well, the military as a whole. And institution as well. Institutionally. Yeah. That includes the ownership of a fair chunk of the Egyptian economy, um, a good deal of its industry. Uh, this is a circumstance which is not unique to Egypt. Uh, it was the case in Turkey. Uh, it has largely been dismantled there. It was the case for a while in China, also dismantled there. Uh, I think that one of the answers to uh, the question of how to restore Egyptian growth uh, and, uh, and meet the, the rising expectations of Egyptians uh, is precisely to dismantle the excessive statist apparatus that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that ensures that sloth and indolence rather than enterprise um, succeed uh, in, in, in Egypt. Um, the second point is every village in Egypt, absolutely every village has an army person in it, retired often in the reserves as a headman, supervisory. We're not just talking about economic privileges, we're talking about a governing role that extends down to the local level uh, and which is in direct competition with 
democratically elected forces and not sympathetic to those who were elected. So um, this is uh, a, a, a very difficult situation. Uh, as a final uh, note, um, the problem, the, the issue of Islamism or Islamists and democracy is really quite well illustrated by the history of Hamas. Uh, Hamas is a threat, was a threat to Mubarak, <coughs> is a threat to the Gulf monarchies, um, as well as to other authoritarians, because what Hamas will tell you if you talk to them, which I think is worth doing, um, is that uh, in the past, if you had a moral agenda in Arab politics, you had to ally yourself with a thug, a dictator, a general, a prince, or some other um, authoritarian figure to get that agenda advanced. Uh, but now, Hamas has shown you can take power at the ballot box. You can take your power directly from an election, which is exactly what the, Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is, uh, sees as the, the model, not surprisingly, since the two are cousins or maybe even father and son. Um, in any event, this is a huge threat uh, to authoritarians in the region, the army in Egypt. It is a huge threat uh, to regimes in the Gulf like Saudi Arabia, where the, the regime is founded on an alliance between a royal family and a religious movement. Saudi Arabia is Islamist in partnership with uh, a privileged royal family. Uh, so the gun and the Quran go together in both places. And what Hamas says is, no, we can do it differently. So that's a threat. And that is the threat that the Muslim Brotherhood poses to the established order in Egypt. And it's why it's so very unsettling to the army. I think they mean well, but they really are, as Paul said, uh, grappling with a very difficult set of issues. I'm Bill Hess. I'm a master's student at the Elliott School. Um, you mentioned that you see Cairo, along with uh, Baghdad, rising as centers of power in the region over the long term and ending up in the camp with Riyadh. Uh, can you explain why you see Baghdad ending up there as opposed to closer relations with Iran? Um, well, uh, first of all, traditionally, as I mentioned, and as you know, in the Mashraq, uh, there were three contending centers of power, Baghdad, uh, Cairo, Damascus. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, a fourth corner, namely Riyadh, emerged from uh, oil wells. Uh, what we've seen in recent years was the, and not in any particular order, uh, the senile repose of Cairo under Mr. Mubarak. Uh, now, um, with the promise of reinvigoration by some sort of new regime, um, whether it's army-led or whether it is parliamentary in, in nature, we don't know. But we do know that this Egyptian government is going to be more assertive of Egyptian views and Egyptian um, interests. And we do know that Egypt has great weight in the Arab world. It's about a fourth of the, of the Arab uh, populations. So uh, I think Egypt, under any government that is vigorous, which I think is what we're headed for, is going to have a much greater weight in the world. Uh, Iran is not a beneficiary of this, uh, not only because Egypt is not uh, Shia, does not accept the ideological innovations of the Ayatollahs, which are the last 150 years they came up with this theory of Ayatollah and It doesn't have any appeal among uh, Sunnis, and, and indeed doesn't have any appeal, uh, much appeal among many Shia also. Um, so there's no ideological affinity. Uh, Iran and Egypt are traditional uh, contenders for influence rather than, uh, than allies in, in the region. Um, the, there's everything in it for an Egyptian government to look to the money in the Gulf um, rather than association with a, an impoverished and beleaguered Iran. Um, and so I suspect that the reemergence of Cairo as a center uh, is in the long term rather bad news for Tehran's sway. Um, particularly the case if you have an Islamist regime in Cairo 
and we end up with one of an even more extreme character in Damascus, which is a real possibility. And then you have a situation in which the, the empowerment of Iran in the region that we inadvertently contrived uh, by allowing them to establish a sort of political occupation of Iraq while we ran the military occupation uh, by holding Syria in place even when it wanted to gain freedom of maneuver away from Tehran by participating in the maiming of Lebanon and thereby pushing Hezbollah to the commanding heights of Lebanese politics in the Iranian-oriented party, and finally by trying to overthrow the elections in Palestine and isolate Hamas, which left Hamas with nowhere to go but the unnatural embrace of the Shia in Iran. You know, we did a lot for Iran. I, I hope they're appropriately grateful, even under these difficult circumstances. We've got two more questions, and I know exactly where they are. There's one there, and one there. Uh, is the uh, United States seem to have any moral standing or credibility remaining in the Middle East, especially after the last 10 years? And I mean, the, or are we seeing more like the uh, Soviet Union in its last days crumbling and, and you know, just trying to treat its uh, vassal states, you know, with a, you know, act, acting with impunity? And, I mean, after we've used the Egyptians, we've rented their torturers to take care of our detainees, we've uh, humiliated the Arabs uh, by having them large sell natural gas at country crisis to Israel. Arabs see us as a uh, ghettoization of uh, the West Bank. I guess I could go on. Uh, so I guess my question is, do, do you have anything remaining for any uh, cultural power there, or can you see the Chinese displacing us over the next 20, 30 years? I think there's stuff remaining. I mean, we've, we've dug ourselves into a pretty big hole. Um, and you look at the, uh, the polling results taken by the likes of the Pew people, uh, the numbers have you know, come up a little bit, but not a whole lot uh, over the last, last couple of years. I think you've touched on a number of the things that, um, uh, that are issues of concern. Um, I would certainly add the, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as the, you know, the, the granddaddy of salient issues that's still out there in a very, very big way. Uh, if I were to name any one thing that could repair damage of all the sort that you enumerated, it would be um, uh, you know, a change on that, which I'm not foreseeing. But um, So uh, you know, is, is there some soft bar left? Yeah, there's some. Um, many of the things that you mentioned are not inherently irreparable damage, but uh, we've, we're still doing a lot of things and the holes that we've dug ourselves in are, are pretty big enough that uh, it's going to be hard to, uh, 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 to, to restore what was once our potential. Just one, one last comment uh, in terms of you know, looking to the likes of the Chinese for, for inspiration. Um, uh, Democrats, and, and true Democrats with a small d in the Middle East, I don't think are looking uh, to China for that kind of inspiration. They're looking to it and, and, and to others like India, as Chaz mentioned before, as counterweights to the United States. Um, authoritarians uh, certainly uh, look uh, anxiously at the, uh, at the Chinese experience, and the Iranian regime, uh, those in that regime are doing so, to see whether this this story so far of explosive economic growth and the Chinese economic miracle of the last three decades with continued firm control by uh, a ruling authoritarian party can continue. I mean, my personal view is that the jury's still out on that, but it's the authoritarians who are more concerned about that rather than the, the Democrats. i make a, just a couple of comments. There's a lot of polling data on precisely this issue. Um, and uh, you can read that through the Pew Charitable Trust uh, findings and uh, I think uh, the, uh, uh, both Zogby and uh, Shibley Tilhami have produced very uh, insightful um, looks at, at our credibility or the lack thereof. Uh, nobody should be under any doubt that our military is still, despite the debacle in Iraq and the, and the uh, travesty in Afghanistan, have uh, uh, lack credibility. We have unexampled military strength, and that is recognized and feared. 
Uh, in fact, the polls generally show that people are more worried about us as a possible force than anybody else except Israel. Uh, so we have prestige in that area, and if that, if that gratifies you, uh, um, uh, then you should feel very good. Um, we have a, uh, we have a, uh, a major issue of communication with the Arab world since the vast majority of Arabs uh, are Muslim, not all are Muslim, um, but Islamophobia is now deeply entrenched in this country. We even have presidential candidates who are running against Sharia, uh, although where they find that in the United States I do not know. Um, uh, and um, coming against this is a wasting asset, a non-renewable research re resource which is relevant to new arrivals like China and Russia, uh, Brazil, India. Uh, and that is, I, I call it fossil friendship. Um, it is the result of years of study in the United States by Arabs and cooperation in the region uh, by American companies. It is not a renewable asset. Uh, it has to be replenished. It's not being replenished as fast as it's being burned up at the moment. Uh, last comment is, don't worry so much about China. China's become a national obsession uh, in some respects in this country. It's the enemy of choice. It answers our enemy deprivation syndrome with a big cure. Uh, it's great for defense budgets. Uh, it's good for high-tech military inventions. Uh, but uh, the Chinese do not have an exportable model. Uh, their economic system, which works very well, uh, is based on Chinese cultural values that are Chinese, not Arab, uh, not Indian, uh, not uh, Central Asian. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not the place to go into all of that, but I think um, China doesn't have an ideology that it can explain to its own people, still less one than the sport. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't have a history of doing anything but sailing in and sailing, sailing out of the region. Right. Second question, then we're going to have the last question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, we've talked a lot about um, the last question, the decreased influence of the U.S. Uh, credibility specifically in the Middle East and in the region. Uh, my question is twofold. Number one, the implications from the Egyptian issue, banning NGOs and uh, everything that's transpiring right now, uh, what do you think that that is going to set as a precedent around the region as our involvement, as we keep trying to keep uh, in increasing our involvement in other conflicts around the area? Secondly, um, you mentioned um, a different stance in the Israeli-Palestinian issue as possibly being a solution for this um, declining credibility. Do you have any other suggestions, any other possible ways that we can go about changing our foothold in the region? I think my biggest advice is uh, avoid shooting ourselves in the foot. I mean, you know, besides the Palestinian issue, you know, the, the, the one other uh, issue in recent years that has even come close to competing with it in salience across the region as a negative factor for the U.S. was the Iraq War. And um, so, you know, not doing things like that, not committing enormous blunders like that. Um, is 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 the first thing. You know, do no harm. Uh, uh, apply the Hippocratic Oath to us. On the first part of your question, I, I hesitate to make a prediction. On, it depends on how that particular case is going to come out in, in whatever discussions we've got ongoing with uh, with the powers that be in Egypt. And I suppose it, it it could set some kind of precedent since the kinds of suspicions uh, that are involved in Egypt uh, exist to varying degrees in the other countries as well. So we'll just have to see how this case plays out if, even just in the next couple of weeks. A couple of comments on <coughs> Egypt. Um, I suspect this fracas will um, increase the wariness of others in the region uh, about our NGOs. Uh, there will be more scrutiny uh, from ministries of interior and the like. Um, and that may impede their work to some extent. 
Uh, but the bigger issue is a strategic question that's typical of questions involving human rights, democracy, promotion, and the like. Um, the lever that is being wielded to get uh, Sam LaHood and the others out is a suspension of aid. Let's be under no illusion. Aid to Egypt is a bribe to stay at peace with Israel. Where are our priorities? Um, I suspect they ought to be with avoiding the resumption of Egyptian or mitigating any resumption of Israeli-Egyptian difficulty. Um, for all sorts of reasons, that makes sense to me. So I think this is something we need to tread very cautiously in uh, with respect to, and some people are not very cautious uh, because we are here in the middle of an institution I apologize to a former member who's present, in which um, uh, the national interest counts far less than particular interests. Um, that's the nature of the political process. Second point um, about things we can do short of bringing peace to the Holy Land that uh, might ameliorate things. I agree completely with Paul. Stop killing people on the scale that we do. It's very hard to retain influence if people suspect that you don't have any regard for their lives, or that of their wives and children, or for their dignity. Um, I think it would help greatly if we were able to find a way to wind down the Afghan adventure in that regard. Um, and here, I just say, although it's off topic, I think that all the talk about negotiating with the Taliban is talking about negotiating the wrong issue. The issue is not who runs Afghanistan. That's an Afghan problem. The issue, I mean, we have developed interests in it. We want to protect the gains for feminism, for example, that we have brought to Afghanistan. So did the Soviets. But in the end, who runs Afghanistan is something Afghans will decide. What we were concerned about when we went there, which we've forgotten, apparently, was making it off limits to Al Qaeda and the like. That is something we can negotiate with the Taliban and with the Afghan authorities and get agreement on. QED. Um, so it would, if we could enable ourselves to extricate ourselves, that would be good. And the final point is, I don't think a war with uh, Persia, Iran, uh, would be of any great assistance to our credibility in the region at all, uh, or our military presence. And I say that notwithstanding the fact that some people have told me there's an old proverb in Arabic that says, if you see a Persian and a snake, kill the Persian first. Um, I don't think that buys you much. Thank you for that quote. <laughs> Last question. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, hear your views. Uh, what is the prospect concerning the future of the different Arab Spring movements in light of the fact that already some months ago, uh, the former Israeli intelligence head, Meir Dagan, said if it would come to an attack and an Iranian retaliation, the region would be destroyed for 100 years and more to come. Now, I see a potentially even bigger danger, and that is the fact that uh, Russia has made very clear that they are not happy with the uh, events in Syria and also Iran. They have sent an enormous amount of military equipment there. Uh, there are presently four aircraft carriers, three Americans and one Russian in the region, and a tremendous uh, number of submarines, frigates, destroyers. Uh, you know, that is the danger of an incident like Gulf of Tonkin, a mistake, you know, some little thing could go wrong. And, you know, I think that the involvement or an escalation involving Russia and China is absolutely there. Uh, given the fact that, you know, the Chinese and the Russians have made very clear that they do not uh, like very much the activities of the new U.S. Ambassador McFowl, who, whose first activity after taking office was to meet with the uh, non-parliamentarian opposition regime change against Russia. Uh, McCain talked about regime change, or alluded to regime change against China uh, in Munich at the security conference. I think we are sitting on a powder keg, which, you know, 
I mean, world wars don't happen necessarily because somebody plans them in the last detail. But I think given the tenseness of all of this, I think you know, uh, European military analysts and Middle East experts are very, very concerned that if you go against Iran, you are in World War III right there. And I think that is the danger right now. Thank you for that answer. Nice <laughs> <laughs> But I still would like to hear what the gentleman had to say. I'll make, I'll make a very quick comment. I think, I think um, um, the major danger probably uh, of blowback from uh, the conflict with Iran uh, to fall on Israel and uh, ironically on those parts of the Arab world which have been least involved in the so-called Arab Spring, namely the Gulf states. Several of those regimes in the Gulf uh, have been put on notice by Iran that given their association with the United States and the uh, base rights that they have conferred, um, they would be overthrown in the event of a conflict. Uh, so you could see the political landscape of the Gulf changed in unpredictable uh, ways. I think you would also see a wave of sympathy throughout the entire Islamic world and in uh, Arab countries with Iran, despite the, uh, the old proverb I cited. Um, the, the odd thing about Syria, which you mentioned, um, but I don't think it would be uh, terribly exacerbated by, by an, Iran, an, an Iranian war, uh, is that uh, in some senses, Syria is already taking on the characteristics of a proxy war between outside powers. It does resemble Spain in the 1930s in, in some respects, um, in that while there aren't foreign volunteers, as far as I know, there certainly are weapons flowing in there uh, to the government and to uh, the armed factions that are fighting the government. And they're coming from somewhere. Uh, I didn't think Senator McCain's intervention at uh, Munich uh, was at all uh, sensible I don't know why he thought it was appropriate to threaten the Chinese with regime change, um, uh, but um, he has a way with words sometimes, and um, I hope they understand that and didn't take it too seriously. Um, the, uh, the question of Russia, um, I think you're quite correct to note that uh, with Russia backsliding perhaps in terms of Electoral politics and democracy, Mr. Putin uh, entrenching himself, um, uh, there must be a lot of concern about the impact of any kind of uh, approval of a, uh, a mob based or mass based or uh, uh, other uh, popular um, uh, pressure and overthrow of, of a regime. Uh, and this, I think, is part of the reason the Russians were so sensitive on the Syrian, uh, the Syrian resolution, which, if you actually read it, uh, was the worst sort of declaratory, or maybe denunciatory diplomacy. The only thing worse than toothless declaratory diplomacy is denunciatory diplomacy, because that insults people without accomplishing anything. Um, and. Um, I think some people actually think that the Russians and Chinese did us a bit of a favor by not letting that thing go through, because it wouldn't have led anywhere but to uh, uh, unrealistic expectations on, on every side. If I, I could just add, um, uh, along the lines of Meyer Dagon's comment that you referred to, uh, yes, I, I would agree that uh, in the event of a military clash initiated either by Israel or one of the scenarios we talked about before with Iran, that there would be a significant chance of uh, hostilities spreading elsewhere in the region. I don't think we're going to see you know, Russian and U.S. aircraft carriers duking it out. But uh, just to give you some idea, a couple of years ago at, at Brookings, uh, there was a simulation uh, run in which started, this was programmed into it, with an Israeli strike, <coughs> airstrike against Iranian nuclear facilities. And by the time uh, time ran out in the simulation, all hell was breaking loose around the region with uh, Iranian missiles, you know, going against not just the Israelis but the Saudis because uh, the Iranians thought that Saudi airspace was used. Um, 
So I, 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 that was just a simulation, but it's suggestive of the sorts of things that can happen and uh, consistent with what Chess says with, uh, say, the Gulf countries, this can only be bad news with regard to the internal political story, not good news if you had uh, a spread of hostilities like that. Let me, let me make an ultimate statement and ask um, a cultural answer in a very short form. <clears throat> the, 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 your, uh, Paul, your reference to 1848 seems to be right on the button. You're dealing with population explosion, urbanization, a lot of young people, a huge number of young people in the uh, thing, no jobs, no economic opportunity. I personally think this is more about economic